I'm Gary Miller. I work for the USDA's Systematic Entomology Laboratory at Beltsville, Maryland. I'm a research entomologist working on the aphidomorpha, which includes aphids in the strict sense, adelgids, and phylloxerids. Today we're going to go uh, and explore the wonderful world of aphids and uh, hopefully be able to make some identifications and kind of work our way around aphid morphology, get some ideas on what structures are important uh, for aphid identification and determinations. So before you can start doing any kind of identifications, of course, you need to make a microscope slide mount and that's for a uh, um, for your first IDs. Preliminary IDs can be made through a dissecting scope, but as we have here on the screen, this is a, a specimen that, this is Aphis gossypii, but what I wanted to do was show you some structures on this aphid that are going to be critical not only in a lucid key, and we're going to, we're going to uh, go through a lucid key in just a few minutes, but also through a traditional, what I might call, paper key. And so some of the structures you're going to be looking at and concerned with are antennal structures. We're going to start from the head and work down towards the caudal area. So you're going to, with aphid identifications, often you'll see a couplet that will talk about the terminal process. And that's the last antennal segment. And that's this structure here. And you also have the base which is also part of the, the last antennal segment. And lots of times in keys, there will be ratios. So when you get to aphid identifications, unlike some of the other Sternorhynchus insects, uh, aphid IDs depend on a lot of measuring. Um, in, in some of the Cochoidea, while uh, measurements are needed there, but in aphids, uh, um, you're doing ratios and doing measurements of the various structures. So often you'll have a ratio with a, the terminal process or process terminalis as it's called divided by the length of the base. Okay, there are other structures on the antenna that are important as well. The third antennal segment, which is shown here, is an important segment because not only are you measuring that, that segment often, but you're often looking at various structures on that antennal segment. There are these structures called rhinaria, um, or some folks call them sensoria, um, but these structures are counted often and uh, in some cases measured and, and uh, in some keys they, they even include distribution on that antennal segment, whether they're in a line or scattered over the antennal segment. Looking at the head, getting closer down towards the head region, there's a structure called the antennal tubercle, which is this area right in here. And I'm, I'm sort of starting out with a specimen that doesn't have much of an antennal tubercle. So when you would look at this particular specimen in a key or when the uh, expert key might call up an antennal tubercle, you'll see whether it's absent or present, okay? And in some cases, and we're going to look at, a, at a, a specimen of Mises persicae in a little bit. That has very well developed antennal tubercles. But the antennal tubercles are not much higher than the fronds, which is this area right here in the center. And so that's a critical structure, a critical evaluation you want to be looking at. Moving down further to the mouth parts. Mouth part structures are the segment right in here or this area right in here. Again, um, aptly named because of the sternorhynchia because it's lower in the, in the ventral area of the, of the specimen. The URS, which is called the ultimate rostral segment, this area here, is another structure that's measured. It's the tip of the mouth parts. And it's measured in its length and often you'll see in a key um, or sometimes in a key you will have to count the number of CD that occur on that rostral segment.
I'm going to look at the, the legs here. So I can get this a little better focus. You also have measurements of the legs, uh, and also the um, you'll have to take a look at the CD, the, the measurement of the CD or sometimes used or beneficial for identification. Length of the CD, sometimes you'll do the ratio of the length of that CD to the, the base of the femur. In some keys also, you'll, you'll um, some of the couplets call for the amount of, of uh, pigmentation that may occur on, on a specimen. These are the spiracles are in here. Sometimes the abdomen has uh, reticulated patterns, and that's sometimes diagnostic. Let's see if we can take a look at some of this reticulation here. And you can see the reticulation nicely over that entire uh, specimen. One thing that is very important when you're identifying aphids is because, because immatures often resemble the, the adults, it's sometimes hard to tell what is an adult and what is an immature. And most keys, well, nearly all the keys are based on adults. And so you're challenged to find out how to tell an adult from an immature. And one of the telltale ways is the genital plate. And there are two genital, or there's a large structure here called a genital plate, as you can see here. And if that is present, you have an adult, okay? The structure below that is called the anal plate. And sometimes that's confused uh, in an immature because folks see that anal plate and they think, oh, they have, a, uh, they have an adult. But you're looking for that, that genital plate. The structure in the center is called the cauda. And this is a, it's kind of a, a rudder-like uh, structure. Um, and this is very diagnostic for uh, identifications. Not only the shape of the cauda, but the length of the cauda, number of CD, the shape of the CD, um, amount of sclerotization. So in keys, you often see a, a fair amount of reference to that structure. And this is interesting, too, because that structure is often compared to the siphunculus. And old timers used to call these cornicles but the siphunculus are what I call the sort of the exhaust pipes, the uh, uh, dual exhaust pipes of the, of the aphid. And, and these structures are also diagnostic, not only in the amount of sclerotization that they might have, or pigmentation rather, um, but also um, uh, sculpturing that may occur on, on, the, uh, on the siphunculus, whether it's tapered, whether it's short, whether it's conical, whether it's absent. Um, a lot of folks may think that uh, uh, all aphids have uh, siphunculi, but uh, there are some aphids that do not have siphunculi. And uh, there are also structures on, on that uh, uh, siphunculus, such as uh, reticulation at the, at the tip, too. Another structure that you may encounter um, for diagnostic purposes is the length of the second tarsal segment. And you would measure that from this point to just before the claw. Other diagnostic features are also found on the first tarsals and the number of CD that sometimes occur right in this area here.
I'm just going to move up to the head area too. Um, we were on lower magnification before, and so I wanted to point out some of the, the structures on the head area also. Um, there's sometimes sculpturing on the head region. And in this case, the head is considered pretty much smooth, but you could, in some specimens or some species, you'll see spicules uh, present on the head. Okay, so this specimen is um, is an aphis and it's a representative of uh, the aphidiny. And uh, what I want to do now is I want to show you one of the macrosophiny. These are the two major groups encountered in aphid identifications, aphid studies. Now, if you can re remember what we looked at with Aphis gossypii, and you can see that in this case, Mises persicae, green peach aphid, while aphid-like, obviously, I mean, here I'm going to scroll down here. Here we have the siphunculi and the cauda. But you'll see some differences here in the structures in the head region. Most notably are those frontal tubercles. And I'm going to zoom up into the frontal tubercles, get a better look at those. You can see the tubercles right there. In this case, they're much higher than the fronds, which is that center portion in the head. You remember, remember when I said how Aphis gossypii had a smooth head? Um, you can see that here in this case, uh, Mises persicae has a lot of uh, uh, scabrous areas all through it, not only on the dorsum, but on the, on the venter. It's a third antennal segment. a nice illustration here of some of the terminal pigmentation that you'll see on, it, on the various antennal segments. And again, this last one, terminal segment, you can see the process terminalis and the base at its base. You can also see a primary renaria found at the base here, and there's also one found at the fifth antennal segment. This shows nicely the accessory CD found on the URS, or the ultimate rostral segment. You see these accessory CD, and these are sometimes diagnostic as well. Again, you can see the sculpturing on that abdomen. This specimen is nice in that it has an embryo inside. In some groups, the embryos are diagnostic. Uh, by and large, uh, immatures, as I mentioned, are not diagnostic or not used. Um, but occasionally, uh, some of the groups use embryos for species identification. And that's also a good check if you're not sure if you have an immature aphid or not. Um, if you have embryos in its body cavity, that's a, a, a good sign that, uh, that you're working with an adult there. And now we're down to the, again, the cauda. You can see that cauda is different shaped and coloration is slightly different. CD are different. A lot of little micro CD found on that cauda. And I mentioned previously about the shape of the siphunculus. 
This is a nice specimen in that it shows that where you have a, um, you can see some narrowing in the, in the center or towards the center, and this expanded area towards the tip. In this case, there's a slight reticulation at the, at the tip of the siphunculus, and also some pigmentation there as well.